welcome to the Did You Know Crypto Podcast, Episode 8, Cryptocurrency Security and Best Practices. My name is Dustin, and first I'd like to say welcome back. Thanks for listening. I'm glad that you are still interested in learning about cryptocurrencies and blockchain, but mostly learning it with me. I really, really do appreciate it. Before we dive in, I want to tell you a quick story about a man named James Howell. You see, James Howell was a British citizen. He'd gotten involved in Bitcoin pretty early, mining the cryptocurrency on his laptop. Yep, you could actually do that back in those days. But at some point, the laptop died. He stripped it for parts, selling them on eBay. And he held onto the hard drive because he said, and I quote, I kept the hard drive in a drawer at home, knowing it held my Bitcoin private keys so that if Bitcoin ever became valuable one day, I would still have the coins that I mined. He had around 7,500 coins on that wallet. And somewhere around 2013, when Bitcoin hit $130, it was actually accidentally thrown out with other junk during a clean out. It now sits somewhere in some British landfill worth about $52 million at today's prices, which is around June 17th, 2018. And there's really so much cringe in this story that I can barely stand it, but let's all learn from James's mistakes and move forward in a more secure way. Today, we're going to be delving into how to securely store and use your cryptocurrencies. We already kind of went through this in episode six on hardware wallets and paper wallets and how to do all that kind of stuff. And this may all seem like a bit of work, and it is to a degree, but it's well worth it for your own peace of mind. Crypto is about you. That's you taking responsibility for your wealth management. There's no AIG or Bear Stearns to go down the tube and suck you along with it. The only weak link in crypto security is you. Now, that being said, there's a lot of off-the-shelf products that are coming out. Mostly right now, a lot of them are designed for more high net worth individuals to do, uh, to use, but there's a lot of stuff coming uh, down the pipe that's going to help the average person to be able to be more secure without having to have a lot of extra hassle. Things like hardware wallets themselves are a, a factor of the market coming in and, and providing for a need. The first thing you need to take care of actually for your, your crypto security is your computer security. You need just basic good antivirus and a malware protector. If your computer isn't secure and filled with viruses, you might as well just throw your wallet or purse out on the street and hope someone doesn't steal it because that's basically what you're doing with your computer. And this is not just with crypto. This is also with all your other personal information because you're going to be entering your social security number, your credit cards, your bank information at some point when you're using this disgustingly infected computer. The two services I would recommend that you have are one, Bitdefender Security, and two, NordVPN. First, let's go over Bitdefender Security. I love these guys. I can secure multiple devices and currently have both my wife and I's cell phones as well as all our computers and all that kind of stuff in our house under their protection for less than 50 bucks a year. It's a pretty plug and play system for the most part. You can set up customized options or just use their autopilot feature and they'll do all the work for you as far as for making sure everything's updated and all the scans are done on a regular basis. For their cell security aspect, I really like it because I can set up a trusted phone like say my wife's or my parents or my best friends. And from that trusted phone, I can actually wipe my phone if it's lost or stolen. Uh, other functions are to locate it or lock it. And for me, the most helpful one is actually an alarm. So from that trusted phone, I can send a text-based alarm to my phone and an alarm will go off Then I can go and find it. And that works for all the other features. So you can send a text-based uh, uh, function to my phone and it'll locate it. It'll tell me where it's at or it'll lock it automatically or it will actually wipe it if I want to do the whole nuclear option. So if it's stolen, stolen, and I know it is, I can just have that trusted phone text my phone and everything's off of it. Bitdefender works on Mac, iOS, Windows, and Android. They also offer in this package things like webcam protection, a free VPN, 
parental advisor, file locks, file shredding for your, you know, digital file shredding and file firewalls. You can find out more at digynocrypto.com slash Bitdefender. Even though I have Bitdefender, I use a different VPN, which is NordVPN. I first heard about these guys on another person's podcast and have been using them for about six months now. They're great. A VPN basically takes that home network or a public one like a cafe and uses that to securely connect through basically almost like a a tunnel in a way to a secure private server, allowing you to access very private and, and, you know, uh, sensitive sites like banking or your crypto exchanges and trading platforms, healthcare, anything like that. And you don't have to be worried about someone stealing your data through a man in the middle attack. It's very simple to do this on public Wi-Fi. What I mean, it's very simple for people to steal your information on public Wi-Fi. So you need to be very careful whenever you connect to any Wi-Fi network anywhere, basically. I never connect to a public Wi-Fi unless my VPN is active, even for simple social media uses, Twitter or Facebook or anything like that. I just make it a habit of only connecting with a VPN if I'm outside of my own uh, home network. And even then I have my VPN running anyway, so it's kind of a moot point. NordVPN has a very simple and easy to use app that you can download on your phone and computer. You download it, you just click a button basically, and you have a secure VPN. You can choose from a variety of different uh, servers and and connections throughout the United States or Europe or wherever you want to be. They also have ones that are P2P friendly, so you can use uh, products like Netflix as well, or if you're going to be using things like BitTorrent to download music, can't recommend that because that's highly illegal, but if you're going to do it, they have the option. Uh, They also offer double data encryption, so your data is encrypted not once but twice, and I'm very happy with them, and they offer a different variety of plans. I personally am on the $3.29 a month plan. It's a sign up for two years, but for three bucks, I mean, that's crazy low. Uh, they also offer up to, you know, it goes all the way up to eleven ninety five if you just want to go month to month. Each plan is good for up to five devices as well. Find out more at digitocrypto.com slash Nord. That's N-O-R-D. So digitocrypto.com slash N-O-R-D. Uh, for the sake of transparency, these are going to contain affiliate links that pay me a commission if you do sign up through that link. However, I have been user have been a user of these services for over six months and only within the last few weeks that I actually approached them um, that's as of June 2018 to become an affiliate of theirs and I'm recommending it because I've already used it and I like it I'm not recommending it because of the affiliate thing I found out that they do that after the fact so anyways if you don't want to give me any money you can just go directly to their sites but I would appreciate that Another thing I would consider if you're going to be doing any sort of significant crypto trading or purchasing is to consider buying a brand new laptop or computer specifically for this use. Brand new, buy it, reset it to factory settings, remove every kind of junk on there. You don't want any games, nothing. This is especially if you're going to be doing anything. We talked about doing paper wallets in a previous episode. If you're going to be doing anything like that, just get everything off there. No games, nothing. Your Bitdefender, your NordVPN, the Brave browser, which is another thing I can mention. Brave is a browser that's developed by the former Mozilla Firefox team. It's what I use pretty much exclusively on my uh, home phone, on my cell phone, as well as my home network. And you can find a link to that at digynocrypto.com slash brave. There's no affiliate there. I actually just kind of like the product. It's built around blocking ads. Uh, Don't download anything. So back to having a wipe computer, don't download anything at all. That's just so you lessen any chance of compromise on your computer. If you don't want to do all that kind of stuff for your crypto trading on your regular computer, I I would try to like air gap this. Like if you, if you also play, you know, online gaming or any of that kind of stuff, maybe do that on a, on, on a, on a different system or something. But I, I just really like to kind of compartmentalize especially anything that's going to have to do with my wealth management and crypto management. The next thing that we want to talk about is a password manager. If you use the same password for any two things online, you're wrong. That's just plain and simple. You're wrong. 
if you use anything personal to you, like a name, an address, a birth date, anniversary, high school, name, mascot, whatever, in your passwords, you're wrong as well. In fact, if any of your passwords res resemble anything coherent, you're wrong. What I'm trying to say is that no matter if you're ac accessing a bank, email, kids' soccer information through the portal at their school, every one of those password passwords should be random letters, numbers, and characters, and be unique for every login. You should never use the same login twice. Why is this? It's not so much that you have to worry day and night about your bank being hacked. It's that you should be worried that the local newspaper login is hacked. And then your name and email, or your name, email, password, whatever it is, is stolen. And if you use that same email login password for, for everything or even just a couple things, thieves can now log into your email, your Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, skim credit card information, banking information, and ruin your credit. In the world of crypto, if your information is stolen, this can be terrible, catastrophic even. I personally use LastPass to manage all my passwords. It basically works like this. I download LastPass, I sign up and everything like that. It asks you to create a master password. This is what unlocks everything within kind of the LastPass vault. You create that master password and unlocks the app itself. And within the app, you start to input each individual site that you use. So you have your email and your banking, you know, the kids' soccer information, your Amazon. And you have to, so you have to do this kind of manually every time. Uh, when you first do it. So at the very beginning, it's kind of a pain because then when you log into Amazon, that next, that, that first time after downloading LastPass, it's going to ask you to, you know, auto fill in. There's going to be nothing there. You're going to have to add all that stuff. So at first it is a little bit of a pain. But once you do that, once you log into Amazon the first time after getting LastPass, you're going to want to go in, change your password, use one of the suggested unique passwords that LastPass will auto-generate for you, and you can drag it from 16 to 24 to 30 unique characters. Copy and paste that in there. Make sure you save that into LastPass. So the first week or so, it's going to be a pain in the butt. Yes, I get that. But in the end, it's going to be worth it. I would recommend a minimum 20-character password, even for the most mundane site. Once you have this all set up and you log into your computer or phone, and you log into LastPass whenever you hit a login page on the internet, LastPass will show you autofills for that site. I would recommend a minimum 20 character password even for the most mundane sites because it's just not worth it to, to try to do like these, these these smaller ones. It's autofilling it for you. So I'll get, I guess I'll get right into the autofill. So once you actually have all this stuff all set up, so even if it's a 50 character password, once you go on to your Amazon and you click the login page, it's going to show up, pop up at the top. Autofill is going to have all the different Amazons. So if you have multiple Amazon accounts, it'll show all those different ones. You click the one you want, autofills the login, username and password, and you're done. So even though it's a very long string of weird characters, it does it all for you as long, once you're logged in securely. I would recommend... That in combination with LastPass, you do what's called two-factor authentication, which is basically what sounds like a second form of authenticating that the correct person is accessing the program. That way, if the pass any of the, the master password is stolen, you still will need this second factor of authentication for logging in. Now, this doesn't just uh, work for only LastPass. We'll get into how it works elsewhere as well. So two-factor authentication can come in a variety of forms. As a note, these all aren't just options for LastPass, but are just the general types of two-factor authentication. The first is the least desirable, and that is via text message. So some of these do this, like right now, if you go into Amazon, it'll offer uh, their two-factor is going to be via cell phone. You'll register a cell phone number with them. And whenever you log in, you'll receive a text with a number. And the reason this is less desirable is that there's a lot of ways, and it's a lot easier than you think for people to be able to what they call port your number. Um, and it's mostly based on human error. So there's been cases of people who have used phone two-factor authentication 
uh, for various crypto related stuff. And people have actually, you know, say called the Verizon, uh, the Verizon customer service, say, Hey, I need to change my, my phone. My, my existing phone on this account is dead and I want to change it over to this new phone. And after, you know, 10 people on the customer service line say, no, they finally get maybe 20 or 30 people they talk to. They finally get to that one person who doesn't follow protocol and does do that. It's not terrible. It's better than just having a password. But if there's any other way, which we'll talk about here in just a second, if there's any other option for two-factor, you're going to want to go with that. The next is TOTP, which is time-based one-time password. This is a one-time password, means it can only be used once, that times out every 60 seconds. So when this six string, seven string of numbers shows up, let's just say one, two, three, four, it's only going to show up for six or 60 seconds. After that 60 seconds, it's replaced with a new one. You can't use that old one anymore. So let's just say you get a password of one, two, three, four, 60 seconds later, you get five, six, seven, eight. You can't use one, two, three, four any longer. It's no longer valid. doesn't matter how many times you try it. The most common apps that use this are Authy and Google Authenticator. LastPass also has their own, uh, as well as uh, UBI key. If a program like LastPass supports TOTP, they will provide a barcode, basically. So any kind of app that allows a TOTP timeout or time-based one-time password uh, second factor authentication, they will, if they offer that TOTP, they will provide a barcode to scan. So you open up like the Google Authenticator app and you'll say, you know, you push the plus button to register a new TOTP and you can collect, you, you can click either enter a number or uh, the barcode scanner and you just scan that with your phone, usually on the screen of your computer or something like that. And it automatically sync up right away. If you are using a software-based two-factor like the Google Authenticator, like the Authy app, I would recommend doing the following to more fully secure it for malicious actors. Consider buying a iPod Touch, whether it's used or refurbished or whatever. You're going to wipe it to factory settings, connect it to the internet, download the Authy or Google or both of these Authenticator apps. After they're downloaded, Disconnect from the internet and never connect to Wi-Fi or if it's 3G compatible, that as well. Don't ever connect to that again. So basically now you have an offline, which means it can't be tampered with or accessed by a malicious actor, time-based one-time password authenticator app. So this is still not the most secure thing ever, but it's way more secure than just using it off the phone that you're constantly using for other things. The TOTP means that the password is created based on one time, so there's no need for it to be connected to the internet. You don't ever need to connect up to the internet. Once it actually gets synced up with the Google Authenticator and everything like that and all the different passwords that you have can they not contained on it, there's no need to ever connect to the internet again. The only reason that you maybe would is if you're going to add a brand new brand new app or whatever that you're going to add to your Google Authenticator, then you might need to connect to the internet to do that. But other than that, you don't ever need to do it again. So uh, it's a bit of a hassle. I get it to carry like another device, but especially if you're going to do these things for, you know, maybe not for some of the more mundane things that you, that you connect to, but for your things like your, like your crypto exchanges and crypto, any of the wallets maybe that use TOTP, I, I would, recommend maybe doing that because it's not something that you're probably going to be accessing, you know, on an hourly or daily basis, but it's something that you might uh, access, you know, weekly. And you can find a used iPod Touch for pretty cheap. I have links to every item that I've been referencing, including just like cheap iPod Touches as well in the show notes on digiknowcrypto.com slash security. The next thing we're going to be talking about are physical authentication keys, also known as UTF. That's uniform to Foxtrot. And these require an actual physical device to be in your possession to authenticate. The UTF utilizes secure encrypted connection between your device and the service or program, whatever that you're trying to access. It ensures it is communicating with the real and not a fake phishing site or program. 
and disallows the ability for a what's called a man in the middle attack. That is someone trying to intercept the temporary code as it's being sent to you and use it to gain access to your secure site or program. This is the most secure commercial solution in my opinion. And I do use a UBI key to further secure my LastPass account as well as other accounts that I have, which means that when I log in and I go to LastPass and I enter my master password, I am then prompted to use my UBI key. I can't just access with my password. I can't bypass this. And this thing basically looks like a very small, thin USB drive that I'll insert into the USB port. And in my case, I use the Neo version of the UBI key, which allows me to use it on my phone as well. So I insert it. I click into the um, little area that I, that I need the uh, key to be entered into. And I lightly press my finger on the button that's actually on the UBI key, sends the password to LastPass, authenticates my login, and I'm good to know. Let's say I right now tell you that my email and password to my last pass right now is Dustin at DidYouKnowCrypto.com, and my password is Crypto1234. You can go right now, download LastPass, put in that username, that password, and log in. But now you're going to be prompted with me using the needing my UBI UTF second factor authentication. And without that device physically in your hand, pushed into your computer, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. Without physical possession of that key, you can't gain access to anything. And since 99% of theft in the digital crypto space is basically through non-physical means, by that I mean hacking or phishing or spoofing, this is a great way to keep your most private information secure in this new digital age. And other than if you make yourself a big target by going online saying, I have $15 million in crypto, most of the time you're not going to be, unless you make yourself a target and well known for having a bunch of crypto assets, thieves aren't going to know, you know, you from Tom down the street who has what, right? So as long as you practice what we call OPSEC, which we will talk about in a little bit as well, you will be fine and don't have to worry about uh, your physical UTF key ever being used to steal your funds. A note I wanted to pass along as well in regards to using phones as two-factor authentication. We kind of touched on this as well a little bit ago. Uh, but another reason that they're really dangerous is that there's been numerous incidences of people having their cell phones compromised. Like I said, when bad actors call cell companies directly pretending to be the customer, gaining access to their cell phones, especially if your personal information has already been compromised online somewhere, say through the Equifax hack, and you use your personal online you know, passwords and all that kind of stuff, basically being your own private information where you live or anniversary, something like that. And gain, they gain access basically to your cell phone, and then they're able to access any kind of texts that are coming to your phone. Verizon even offers the ability to send and receive texts via their website. It's not safe. So if you have any other option, use a two-factor two authentication like Authy or even better, a UBI key. What I mean, just shooting back here for a second, that Verizon offers the ability to send and receive texts via their website. This is also why something like LastPass and having a random, unique password for all your websites is important. So let's just say your Verizon login password is that same, you know, my home street plus my anniversary date plus an exclamation point, And I think that's secure. Well, I use that also logging in on my very unsecure local, you know, 10,000 circulation uh, newspaper to log into my website there. Well, that newspaper gets hacked. Now that password's out there. And a lot of times these hackers do is they just hit up every website that they can think of. They don't even have to know that you have it. They probably hit up every other cell phone carrier just to see what works, right? But now it works on Verizon. So now what can they, what can they do in your Verizon? They can actually go, there's a spot in my Verizon under that My Verizon tab that you can actually go in and any text incoming to you shows up there. So if they wanted to hack your crypto exchange or whatever and you use phone two-factor authentication, when that temporary code comes in, it's going to come onto your phone. You're going to get a text and you're going to be like, well, why is it sending me that? Well, now they are accessing your exchanges and probably stripping out all of your crypto that's on that exchange. So 
be very careful. So the next thing we're going to want to talk about is backing up your two-factor devices and apps. If you have Google Authenticator on your phone and you lose that phone and you don't have the backup, you're going to have to go through a very arduous process of re-registering with each site a new two-factor authenticating uh, authentication cred credential, which is very difficult to say the least. It's good that it's very difficult. So that someone can't just claim to be you via email, get new two-factor registered, then, you know, do all the bad stuff that they're going to do. But you don't want to go through this whole process because it, it, it is a real pain in the butt. In the Google Authenticator and Authy and UBI key and LastPass, any of these two these software-based two-factor authentication apps, they have you have the ability to print out the backup seed codes that will allow you to recover your all your authenticator passwords if you lost your phone. Or let's just say if you get a new phone you want to transfer, you can't just Let's just say you've got the old Note 7. Actually, no. Sorry, you wouldn't have that. Let's say the Note 8, the Galaxy, uh, the Samsung Galaxy Note 8. Next year, you get the Note 9. If you have these passwords, all you have to do is enter them, and all your two-factor authentication stuff is going to show up right in that Google Authenticator app. If you accidentally send it out, you're going to be kind of up, you know what, creek for a little bit until you can uh, work with each individual app and program and company and get that worked out. I personally keep a copy of mine printed uh, in, a, in an actual hard copy in a safe location, i.e., you know, like a safe or a safety deposit box, whatever you have is what you should use, and that's what I use. With UBI key, there's actually no backup C. However, it is smart to have a distinct separate backup UBI key, and this is what I do as well. With LastPass in particular, if you have a premium account, which you actually have to pay for, but it's really not that much per year, you can have up to five UBI keys associated with your account. So that means if you lose the main one that you usually use, your backup will still allow you to access LastPass. So basically any five of those would allow you to do it. As far as physical security goes, we've kind of touched on this a little bit already. OPSEC is something I mentioned prior. This means operational security, and it's important. Actually, it's very important in this space. Obviously, I am public about my affinity and ownership of crypto, so I need to be a little bit more con careful in how I conduct myself. Getting back on point, there have been cases of kidnapping, mostly in play, you know, third world, more kind of kidnapping prone countries, you know, Eastern Bloc, Eastern European countries of people who were very well known and vocal about their crypto wealth. Most people listening to this would probably be best off just to never discuss how much money they have in crypto. We want to talk about it. We want to say, yeah, I own some crypto. But if you have a significant amount, especially, and people go, well, how much do you actually have invested in this? It's always best to be opaque, especially in public settings, you know, outside of personal conversations. If you have really close personal friends that you already you know, talk about how much personal fiat wealth that you have, then that's probably fine. This is up to you and what your discretion level is. But especially in public spaces, especially if you have a significant amount, I, I just would be very careful about it. There's no reason to make yourself a target for hackers or other malicious folks. So it's net best not to be in some public Facebook crypto forum and saying, yeah, I just made $50,000 this year or something like that. And it turns out that you have extremely terrible... Um, you know, kind of just security on your computers and over your crypto, and then soon you lose it. So it's just best just keep your mouth shut, you know, stack your coins, make your money, but uh, uh, do so humbly and silently. The interesting thing actually about the modern digital age is that you're actually probably more secure in keeping a paper with all your passwords written out on it right next to your computer than, and, than doing it uh, in, in any kind of digital form these days. Since most computer crime is con uh, conducted by those not actually accessing the computer in its physical form. So unless you're vocal about having a large amount of crypto, you don't really need, about wor need to worry about someone breaking into your home, finding the physical backups of your passwords, your UBI keys, and all that kind of stuff. That being said, I think it is best to secure any physical backups in a secure location you know, things like safes, safety deposit boxes, hidden safes, those sorts of things. 
for items such as printed out private keys, I would highly recommend that you split these keys in two or even maybe three and having them multiple copies of those splits in different locations, right? So say just for simplicity's sake, you have half that key in your home safe and the second half in a safety deposit box or maybe a family member safe in a different state or city. The multiple region model is really the best option. Let's say you have two copies of the backup in your home safe and one in a local bank, but what if you have an earthquake, wildfire, tornado, it destroys both locations, what are you gonna do now? It's best to locate backups in multiple regions if possible. Some would call this overkill, but the cost, especially when your crypto holdings start to become larger, it's, it's really negligible. It's not a big cost to do this. Secure backups could also include encrypted thumb drives like IronKey that are tough and rugged, but require a password to open the encrypted files. I don't necessarily recommend carrying, say, a Word doc in one of these with your private keys due to the fact that if you aren't careful, plug this, plug this into an unsafe computer, after you decrypt it with your passwords, that compromised computer could compromise the now decrypted Word file. Only use non-physical backups like this if you're very careful with what computers you actually plug this into. In episode six, we talked about hardware wallets like the Trezor and Ledger Nano S. Those wallets will give you both a pin and a recovery seed. And make sure that if you have a hardware wallet as your main storage for your crypto, that you use the same OPSEC and physical security we just talked about to secure your recovery seed. I'd personally split these up into multiple locations so that if any one place was compromised, it wouldn't have, uh, that person wouldn't have access to it and do the same multiple regional model as well if possible. Now, remember the story of the guy at the beginning who lost millions, actually tens of millions of dollars because he tossed out a hard drive. Don't be that guy. He was basically just storing a very rudimentary software wallet on a hard drive. Now, he was a perfect example of what can happen. If you throw that away on accident, now you have no way of recovering it. He may have even held onto it. Let's just say he did. You don't ever know. I mean, hard drives can fail and often do, especially older ones if it's one of those old HDDs. And he may have been able, let's just say he didn't throw it away, but Five years later, when it reaches 5,000 or even when it reached its all-time high of 20,000, he tries to go and plug that in, that hard drive might have failed as well. Back up your wallets. Save and back up your seed phrases and private keys. Back up everything. Store it securely. Don't ever let your guard down on this and get complacent about, well, this one or two backups is good enough. I'm not saying that you're going to be worth $52 million one day, but I am saying if you're careless with your money, crypto or whatever, whether it's 500, 1,000, or 10,000, that can disappear. Be an adult, take responsibility. If you wanna go a step further than what is probably necessary for the average person, but you can, this is, you know, it's just something to consider. Having multiple cold wallets. If you're holding significant amounts of crypto, I would consider multiple cold wallets for long-term storage. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. This could mean having multiple Zappo cold storage wallets. So Zappo will store Bitcoin in, basically they have them in these old Swiss mountain bunkers. You can do it that way. You could have multiple Trezors or multiple ledgers, whether it's two Trezors, 15 ledgers, whatever. And just kind of split your crypto among those, save and back up all those recovery seeds. But then that way, if say one wallet, God forbid, is ever compromised or anything like that, then you've got it split up. Whatever your risk tolerance is and financial ability is will kind of determine how deep you kind of get into that. Air gap for purchases. If you hold significant funds and don't want to advertise but want or need to use your crypto for a, you know, one or multiple purchases to actually buy stuff with it, actually use this in the economy, I would consider using a platform like an Uphold or Coinbase, although I don't like Coinbase, any other large centralized platform, basically, to effectively air gap you from someone who may try to investigate your wallet. Let's say you live in a place like New Hampshire that actively uses crypto for daily purchases and someone wants to sell you a boat 
but only in crypto. Let's just say you hold a hundred or five hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin. You may not want to actually flash that around. So I'll tra uh, transfer that amount for the purchase to my uphold account, and then say to a separate ledger wallet I use for purchase. This way, the buyer can't see how much you actually have. You've effectively washed your Bitcoin from your primary long-term storage wallet from public view. Remember that everything on a blockchain is viewable. So let's just say I had $1 million in Bitcoin in wallet A, I transfer 15 grand to wallet B, and I pay the seller in wallet C. Or I pay him in his wallet, we'll call that wallet C. Wallet C can trace back to wallet B, the money that they got, and especially if it's just the first time you've ever used Wallet B, it's only going to have one input into it, which you can trace right back to Wallet A and go, wow, this guy's got a lot of money in Bitcoin. And then word starts to spread around town. May not be the best thing to do. If you sent Uphold, if you sent that money to Uphold, you've sunk your $15,000 worth of Bitcoin into pools of tens of millions of dollars in Bitcoin and then back out to now wallet B. So it's going to go and there's no way to basically tell which wallet it was that originally sent that 15,000. Especially if, if you break it up into multiple odd chunks so you send 5,000, then 1,000, you know, then, you know, another 9,000 or something like that so you break it up so it's really hard to tell. This isn't about actually hiding activity from the tax man. Since, you know, any of these centralized exchanges will, you know, um, always report you to the IRS, report any gains that you've ever made. It's about making sure the dude on Craigslist doesn't know that you hold a lot of Bitcoin. I hope this helped you understand how to secure your wealth better. This is by no means not an all-encompassing end-all, be-all. These are just some of the things I've picked up along the way. I think that there are some of the best practices out there. If you have any suggestions... Please comment on our Facebook page, Instagram, or Twitter, or you can email me directly. I want to thank you again for listening. All of our social media contacts and everything like that can be found at didyouknowcrypto.com. That's didyouknowcrypto.com.